Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second webinar um, in our series of self-management webinars, um, which is a collaboration between Bipolar UK and the wonderful team at Cardiff University at the National Mental Health Centre. Um, thank you, those of you who have come back for a second second session. We had a session last week, and uh, we've taken on all of your feedback. We did a brilliant job um, to kind of editing down our content from last week. So if you weren't able to hear everything that was covered, which was basically an introduction to bipolar, what causes it, what are some of the, um, the, the triggers to avoid, that's a really great uh, presentation uh, for you to look through. And I really recommend you, can, you, uh, you go back to it if you haven't seen it already. Uh, all those of you just want to recap on it because you didn't hear it properly, it's there so you can, you can follow through with it. Um, my name is Simon Kitchen. I'm the Chief Exec of Bipolar UK. Um, we're one of the leading peer support um, charities in the country. We're the only national charity dedicated for, to people with bipolar. And the, the, the heart of our mission is to be able to enable every single person affected by bipolar um, to live well and to be able to achieve their potential. And a really key part of that and a big part of our philosophy is that people with bipolar are the experts in the condition. And it's through their wisdom uh, that they've learned about living well um, that really enables people to be able to, to be able to live well with bipolar. Uh, we're also very lucky to work with some wonderful academics. Some of them are, are on this call here today uh, who, who work at Cardiff University and they really are the, the experts uh, beyond the, the experts of lived experience. And what they're going to be doing here today is really kind of sharing with you some of the best techniques and approaches uh, to living well with bipolar. Um, we're going to be covering some uh, three key topic areas. We're going to be looking at medication. We're going to be looking at um, psychological approaches. And we're also going to be looking at lifestyle changes. Don't worry if you didn't manage to, to watch the webinar next, uh, last week. Um, you can still get a lot out of this session by just, uh, by just dialing in. So there's, there's, there's no problem there at all. Uh, welcome for, uh, to, to this session. and Thank you for joining us. So... Um, as you probably remember last week, uh, Ian and I had a competition. We were saying um, that uh, we're going to have a competition to see who had the, the best shirt. Um, last week, obviously, there was, a, there was a few issues with the technology, and we thought as a way of kind of livening this one up and to demonstrate this, is it the live show we have, uh, we, have been, um, we have been putting on some jazzy shirts. So, Ian, are you there? Do you want to show people what your shirt is tonight? I think you win hands down, Simon, actually. This is as jazzy as I get, actually. So, yeah, so I, 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 I concede defeat at the start of the, of the <laughs> webinar. So, yeah, that. I, 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 I can't quite make out, though. What, what's the, what, are they fish that are on your, your shirt? What is, what is it that we're looking at? It is, in a, it is an aquatic scene, so a bit of a fish out of water on some of the topics here today. So, yeah, yeah. I've, got, I've got lots of fish. So, um, obviously, these are, these are live. They are interactive. So... Um, there is a Q&A um, function uh, on, on the Zoom call. So uh, put any questions in and also please do vote for who you think has got the better shirt, me or Ian. So that'll be, we we'll really look forward to, we'll do, a, we'll do a count at the end and see who's won. So um, I'm sorry, John, but I don't think yours even counts for, for being in the nomination process there. because I'm wearing Versace. Uh, there's, no, there's, no, there's no effort that's gone into that. Um, I was just gonna, it's Versace. Okay, Knowing it's Versace. John, a lot of effort's gotten into that. You should see what he looks like normally. So, uh... <laughs> so, so Ian, just to kick off, really, I think we were, we were talking before this call how a lot of the questions that come to us at Bipolar UK are about medication. And a lot of people with bipolar want to talk about their medication because the only chance they get to do talk about it is usually with their, their doctor or the pharmacist. And it's obviously a really personal thing for them as well because obviously dealing with the different side effects of medication, different combinations is really personal for them. And a lot of people with bipolar um, also see one of their goals is to try to come off medication. And that, that's an understandable thing because a lot of stigma attached to medication. But I think what we really want to bring out today is the fact that medication plays an important role, but it's not the only part of staying well. And it's about the key blend of the different combinations of the things we're talking about today. Do you want to say a few words on that? No, I think you're entirely right. I think it's a really important and difficult issue. And it's a matter of weighing up those risks and benefits, if you like. Medications aren't without side effects. And I see the first question that's come through on the question and answer is about, is lithium worth the side effects that it causes? And I think these are individual questions that need to be 
thought about, you know, for some people, yeah, um, uh, you know, medication can be absolutely vital in helping them keep well and live in the best life that they can. Um, and, you know, um, probably the majority of people with bipolar disorder re require medication at some point in their illness. We're going to talk a little bit about that more today and probably we can come back and discuss those issues in the panel discussion at the end. But it really is kind of an individual issue of weighing up the, 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 the downsides from taking medication and we need better, we need more research and better medications from the undoubted benefits that medication can bring to some people. Ian, that's great. Um, and those are things that we will be covered on it. And you are a, a, a trained psychiatrist as well, which I only just gave just before this call, which is, which is great. We had the prelim call. Um, you can't comment on people's individual medication prescriptions, but you can actually take very detailed questions about individual treatments, can't you? So yeah, I um, think we, so we that, need to talk in generalities. You know, what we can't do is kind of answer everybody's individual questions about their regimes, but we can, we can talk and, you know, yeah, the rest of the team can, 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 can chip in to, to talk about some of the general issues that have come up in our psychoeducation program. You know, it'd be really great. We're going to get some video that interviews um, some of our people with lived experience about their experience of medication. So, you know, to, sh to sharing that together can give a little bit of a taste about, you know, what psychoeducation approaches can bring to, to resolving these issues and helping people make these difficult decisions. Thanks, Ian. And this is just to, for those of you that didn't join uh, last week, this is a condensed version of, a, of an education program which Cardiff University have been running uh, for, about, for about 10 years now and it's been proven to be really effective. So it is a taster. It's not going to provide all the answers, but it will hopefully be able to put, put you in the right direction uh, and to help you have a more informed discussion on it um, with your, with your um, psychiatrist or your pharmacist or with your GP as well. Um, so we're just going to run through what we're going to be covering here today. And I'm going to do a couple of shout outs to, the, to the, those who are doing the presentation. So um, is a read your name out. Um, if you just want to wave to the, uh, to the audience, that'd be fantastic. So we're going to start off with Ian and John. You're going to do, be doing the first presentation on, on medication, giving a kind of a good grounding on the different types of medication. And then we're going to do another pre-record so that's Hannah and John are going to do a pre-record. So Hannah, are you on the call as well? Yeah, hi, I'm here. Brilliant. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. Hi, Hannah and John. John, you're there as well. You've, I presumed you've already waved because it's not coming up on my screen. So I, I'm taking it on trust that you are waving. Um, thanks, Hannah. Thanks, John. And then we're going to talk about psychological approaches. And um, we've got Holly. Holly, do you want to wave? Everybody's waving, Simon. Oh, they sorry. I, I could just see yeah. Hannah there on my screen, so apologies. Uh, we've got Kate as well. Um, and then we're going to be talking at the end about lifestyle approaches. So we've got Alice, and then we've got another pre-record with Alice and Hannah as well. So that's, that's great. Any issues with any of the pre-records this time, Ian and I are going to be rifting it with some pre-recorded, pre-planned questions as well. So please do stick around. Hopefully there'll be no technical issues this time. So, um, I think without further ado, Ian uh, and John, do you want to take it away with the first presentation on medication? Thank you very much, Simon. Yes, the first uh, presentation this evening is about medication. It's a short video that Hannah and I did uh, at the end of last week, and then Ian and I will be talking about medication after that. So, uh, um, QVT, as they say, Cat. Okay. Hey, Hannah, how are you doing? Hi, John. I'm good. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Um, so you, you've got a lived experience of bipolar disorder, and um, do you take medication? Sometimes. Okay. Which medications do you take sometimes? Um, well, I've taken a lot in the past, so mm. uh, there's a very long list <laughs> of different types of medication, different combinations of medication. Um, and at the moment, I'm sort of on a as and when required treatment plan. Uh -huh. so. so how many years have you been taking when how many years have you been taking medication for, would you say? Um, probably started around 10, 12 years ago. OK, and what did you start on an antidepressant, I guess? Antidepressants, yeah. So mm -hmm. things like um, 
cyclopram, mm -hmm. and fluoxetine, mm -hmm. and just uh, then it went on to kind of a mixture of fluoxetine and mitrazapine, and just different combinations trying to stabilize the depression more so than any mania because I didn't recognize that at first. Had you been diagnosed then or are they still treating you for the unipolar the, depression? Treating me for unipolar depression, yeah. Okay then. And did you find the antidepressant helped? I know it's complicated um, with the different regimes and getting the dose right. Yeah, I think that I was so heavily depressed at the time that they did help but they weren't a cure. Hmm. Okay, then. so it didn't mm -hmm. fix the depression. Okay, but do you think it made your mood more unstable? I know it's difficult, sort of looking back. Uh, but do you think the anti, you know, some for some people antidepressants who have bipolar disorder, sometimes the antidepressants can make the mood unstable um, and even induce a bit of mania as well. Did you get anything like that? Um, sometimes I've had sporadic moments of maybe hypomania. Mm -hmm. um, where I would maybe at two in the morning just randomly be like, okay, I want to go to the beach, let's go. And force my mother out of bed to come with me to go <laughs> to the beach. Yeah, nice. but she, she was very accommodating, so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was quite a different, quite a contrast between, you know, the depression side of things. And then when things flipped, you know, my mum wanted to accommodate so that, you know, that was doing things when, as and when I felt yeah. like doing it, but yeah. So when did you get a diagnosis then for, of bipolar disorder? Um, I started querying bipolar disorder a few years ago now. Okay. And did they start you on a mood stabiliser? Because that's often what they do uh, on diagnosis. Did um, they start you anything like that? Yeah, I was given... Oh, uh, uh -huh. and they wanted me to try Lamox. Lamotrigine? Lamotrigine? Or Lamotrigine. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I have um, a generalized anxiety disorder on okay. top, so when they told me that you can get a life-threatening rash from taking Lamotrigine, I did not want to take it. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's fair enough, isn't it, really? Yeah. <laughs> so have you tried any Apart from the quotidian, have you tried any mood stabilizers? No. Yeah. I don't get on well with uh, medication because of my anxiety disorder. Okay. Because um, it's more of a sort of health anxiety. Uh -huh. So I start worrying about all the side effects and things like that, which then make me very anxious and have a lot of panic attacks. So medication doesn't generally work for me. You look through the... Um the information sheet that comes with the medication then and looking at all the different side effects and thinking, oh, yeah. Yeah, and then, and then I then, sort of give myself all the symptoms. Yeah, so. this feels like you're going through it, yeah. Okay. Do you think, I mean, I know you were concerned about the rash with uh, Lamotrigine, which is really, really pretty rare. Um, but it, sound, it, it sounds like your mood's, you're managing your mood okay now without a mood stabiliser, aren't you? Um, mostly, yeah. I, I do have to have a very strict... Um, routine and there are a lot of modifications to my lifestyle so when I work I only work part-time small hours and when I've been uh, studying as well that's been part-time as well I try to keep my stress levels very low okay that's good and what medications do you take you said you take them when you need as, as and when you need them what sort of things do you take um, at the moment, uh, I take diazepam, mm -hmm. um, not regularly, it's just, yeah, just when, you need it. Yeah. when I need it. Um, that generally, it doesn't work for everybody, but when I can be a bit hypomanic, I get a lot of anxiety on top of that. Uh -huh. I don't I mean, get a, agitation. Or ang Do you get ag agitation or yeah. rather than with, with anxiety as well? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm sorry, so, I interrupted you. That's okay. <laughs> but that helps to kind of calm me down a bit and yeah. get out of my head a little bit. So. We talk about um, medication for people who have bipolar disorder. We say it's like any chronic condition. Some people, for any chronic condition, some people will need to take medication and other people don't. Uh, and we're certainly not um, 
saying that everyone with bipolar should take medication. And it sounds like you found, you've tried the medications, the benefits and the side effects and the, and they don't weigh up the way they, you want them to. And so you've, you're managing your own way. And that's, that's ideal really, isn't it? You're in charge of your medication regime. Is your GP um, helpful or not helpful? Sorry, is your GP supportive in your use of medication? Uh, yeah, well, it depends what GP I get. I do try to, when I book an appointment, I do try to book a specific GP because they are very supportive mm -hmm. and have a lot of knowledge of mental health. Mm -hmm. um, so when I see them, they're pretty good about it. And because my psychiatrist in the past has prescribed things like catiapine, mm -hmm. if um, I do need it, then my GP can just prescribe it to me. That's good. Okay. Would you take catiapine again? If I need it, yeah. Okay. There are times where my mood is so out of balance that I think that lifestyle and things mm. like that aren't working. So then there are times where medication is important. What's the what's the worst side effect you've had from medication, or the most undesirable uh, side effect you've had from medication? Um, for me, that's when it's the brain fog. Uh -huh. I don't know what you'd call it, but I feel like I'm a kind of zombie and I just, it's very kind of a very apathetic feeling. So mm. I'm not like, it's kind of numbing, you know, I'm not feeling happy and I'm not feeling sad and it's just kind of not feeling. Yeah. So that was a big factor in me deciding not to take medication. It's interesting what you say about the, um, being uh, over sedated because lots of people especially perhaps on mood stabilizers say that their range of emotions can be limited just that little bit too much and they do feel like they can't um enjoy i'm not saying enjoy the highs but have a ra full range of emotions but i think for, for most people who've been on the course i think it's a decision that they make if if their changes in mood are so significant that it's, it's upsetting to them um maybe putting up with that um restriction is, is a good thing. I don't know, it's a very personal decision, Hannah, isn't it? It is. I think that some people, you know, their symptoms are so severe that, you know, you have no choice in it. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think I'm lucky enough that I, I do, but I also have to recognize that there are times where I do need medication and yeah. I have to be, you know, I need my support network there because sometimes I don't recognize and I need them to prompt me and say, look, you know, it's time to take some medications. So. Yeah, that's good. I mean, you're, you're fortunate to have, have that, that around you. That, uh, But you, you learn these things through bitter experience, Hannah, don't you? You know, you, you've tried different medications, you've tried different things, and it, it sounds like you've got, you know, something that works pretty well for you. But it always is a work in progress, I guess, and it is, you can always tinker and try and change things a little bit. And I, I guess also you, you change as well yourself as, you know, as the months yeah. go on. And you this, you know, I might not be off medication forever. It might be a case that, you know, in a year or two, I'm, I take medication every day. So it's kind of just adapting to how the life goes, how your life goes. Thank you. Well, how my life goes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, just that. Oh, nice, nice. So, Hannah, how did you come to the decision about uh, whether or not to take medication? Um, well, I've taken a lot of different kinds of medication. Um, like I said, a really long list. Mm -hmm. And I, I just sort of decided that the side effects were too bad. So the brain fog, the sedating effect. Um, weight gain, things like that. Um, I just, they weren't helping me to live the life that I wanted to live. Mm. And so for me, it was just a case that I could learn to manage my mental health without the medication mm. when possible. Okay, that's useful. It's, it's good to have a plan. I think we talked about in the first webinar, and I think you mentioned it actually, it's good for the people around you to know um, how things are with you and what how you want to be managed or treated sorry managed is the wrong word how you want to be treated yeah it's good for family members to know what medication you are taking mm. what dosage you're taking so that yeah. if there is you know a lapse in your health where you are not well enough to take care of yourself that yeah. 
they can step in and make sure that you're getting everything you need. <laughs> hey, thanks, Hannah. Thanks for answering the question so openly and honestly about your experience with medication. Um, and we'll go back now to the um, the live webinar. Hey, so see you soon. Bye. Bye. Are you not waving? Okay. Did you? <laughs> Thanks, Hannah. I'm just going to share my screen. What do you think, Ian? Did I do all right? Good. I think Hannah brought up some really excellent points there about that balance for each individual of weighing up the the, the benefits of medication from the, the the side effects. And you know, there are no easy answers here. Clearly, one of the things I what I want to make very strongly is I think what we need is better options. We need better medications that work that we can know who's going to respond to and that don't have some of the side effects of what they have now so that's mm. what we're working towards and that's why we need more research i think to to to, to take us forward along that path answering um hannah's or uh, with regard to hannah um i mean hannah's chosen or ch hannah's decided not to take medication do you think everyone with bipolar disorder should take medication no i don't think there's any you know should here I think most people with bipolar disorder find that medication is one of the things that can help them lead the best life that they can. Um, so, so for some people, that's, that, 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 that's not the case, but I think it has to be that individual choice. Mm. I, I think my experience, I don't know about you, John, uh, over the years is that for most people with bipolar, um, yeah, a, medication can be helpful as part of that package of ways in which they can yeah, uh, help themselves stay as well as possible. Mm, I agree. Um, in clinics, we often compare it to diabetes. Some people with diabetes, I, I don't know if it's a very good um, comparison, but some people with diabetes can manage uh, their diabetes through lifestyle approaches. Yeah. And we say that's very similar to bipolar disorder. Do you think psychiatry is a little bit different than um, other disciplines of medicine, where in, in, psych in psychiatry, you might not know if a medication works until you try it for a time and then you have to increase the dose and take that for a bit longer and it can be a bit frustrating and challenging waiting for a drug to work and then maybe it doesn't work and then and then even for some people a drug um, seems to work for some time and seems to lose its um, effectiveness. I think that's that's definitely the case in psychiatry. I actually think that's probably the case in most other areas of medicine as well yeah and what you know, one of the things that would be great to have is better ways of predicting you know, you know, who, you know, because at the moment it, it's often a, a, a case of, 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 of suck it in C to find the particular medication or combination of medication that works the best. If we could, you know, find better ways of, of, of predicting who's going to re respond to what, that would be a, a, a fantastic advance, I think. But I think, you know, the rest of medicine's, you know, pretty much like that as well, I think. Oh, there we are. Tidy. I'll go. So session four um, of the bipolar course that we've run, Pepsi course, um, is, is about medication. And these are some of the slides that we've taken from it. So Ian and I'll just go through them quickly. Um, and that's the ideal medication for bipolar disorder. It's good at treating depression. It's good at treating mania. And it's um, good at preventing episodes of depression and mania. Uh, coming along in the future. It's, uh, it's a prophylactic medication. And the important thing about um, prophylactic medications, such as mood stabilizers, is that they should be taken uh, when fe people are feeling uh, well. And um, I think Hannah said off camera that she, she learned um, that she needs to take medication uh, a lot of the time, not just when she was feeling unwell, just to have that stability. Yeah, I think those are two important points, John, that actually for many people with bipolar disorder, it's not just when they're unwell, that there's med benefits from medication. And the other thing just to point out is that in that list of those things that characterize something that's the ideal medication, you know, many of them, you know, most of the medication we have don't tick all of those boxes. Mm. So, it's, so that's why sometimes it's a matter of combining medications together to, to find that, that best combination to help people well. So those are some of the um, mood stabilizers we use. Lithium, gosh, and it's been around for 60, 70 years in psychiatry. Still and probably good. still the medication with the yeah. best evidence base that it's effective for that job of keeping people well. So mm. not a, a medication with, not without its problems. I see on mm. the question and answers that, you know, very helpful uh, comment that it's really important to have blood tests regularly with lithium to and particularly to keep an eye on some of those kind of long-term side effects like causing kidney problems.
but yeah, still for many people, lithium can be, you know, the, the, you know, the best option. Hmm. Um, it's, it's in the nice guidelines, isn't it? As being one of the, yeah. the things you should start with. Why do you think it's not used routinely then in, by cycling? Well, a cynical person might say that it's, it's, it's been around for so long that no drug companies are making any money out of using it. So, hmm. so that there's a lot of, big pharma budget going pushing some of those other options so that might be the cynical way obviously i wouldn't be a cynical man john as you know but um, i'm sure that comes into it it's still probably the medication that has the best evidence base for and should probably be used more in bipolar i think it should i think the days when they had big lithium clinics uh, have gone yeah. the way mental health teams have been restructured and lots of uh, services rely on the the antipsychotic drugs such as gutiapine or olanzapine maybe and the, and the anti-epileptic drugs, the sodium valparate, the carbamazepine, and the, the motrogene. Um, but as you say before, you know, they, they've all got their own concerns. Um, yeah. did, you, did you want to say something about sodium valparate? And I think the biggest issue with sodium valparate is in its use in, in, in women, particularly women in their childbearing years, because we do know that probably more than any other medication used in the treatment of bipolar disorder, there are particular problems yeah, yeah, for, the un, for the unborn baby, for the fetus, yeah um if if it's taken in pregnancy so if if it is used in in women in that age group contraception and making sure yeah that the, the, there's no chance of pregnancy is absolutely vital but actually increasingly it's not thought to be a good option and other all other options need to be explored before valparate thanks yeah so the next slide um is something we've touched on already is about some medications to treat high mood and depression and i think uh those uh are the ones there's called promazine and haloperidol pretty old uh, antipsychotics but they're still used and they're still pretty effective uh there we are can i just go on to the next slide because i'm aware of time um and medications to treat low mood what do you think i mean some psychiatrists um don't like using antidepressants at all in fact i've known some who say they won't use an antidepressant for someone who's got bipolar disorder what's your opinion on that Ian? well i think if we go to the next slide john that we've listed some of the issues with um treating using antidepressants in bipolar disorder because probably the evidence is is that they don't work as well for bipolar depression as depression occurring not in somebody with bipolar disorder there are also some other worries that, that in some people they can be associated with triggering a high episode a manic episode and actually probably more worrying than that is that it can be associated in in increasing cycling and leading to conditions like rapid cycling which can be difficult to live with and, and, and difficult to treat so so yeah again i think on the next slide john you you, you you've, you've covered some of the alternative ways to to deal with depression that doesn't involve antidepressants. But back to your original question, I don't think there's any 100% uh, right or wrong here that for some people they do find benefits from taking antidepressants and that shouldn't be something that's you know, not, not available to them. No, I think you're right. For people who, have, who struggle a lot with depression, I think saying that they maybe shouldn't have an antidepressant, it can seem a bit harsh. You know, if the antidepressant, provided it's it's given maybe with a with a mood stabilizer and a, and a relatively low dose of, and there's support there i think it's it's a very useful medication um ect do you want to say a few things about ect just uh, for severe depression it's probably the the most effective treatment that we have there's a lot of doubt about how you how it is having that effect and we, we maybe not understand as much as we can but I suppose what I would say is if one of my family or if I myself had a really severe life-threatening depression, it, might, it would be a treatment that I would definitely consider uh, uh, as an option. I, I, and I think, you know, I've seen it save lives so many times that it would be a shame if we lost that as an option for, yeah, for, for, for depression that really is causing people kind of you know, threatening their lives. It is. I think lots of people have a really bad impression of it, and that impression is probably incorrect from you know films and uh, TV documentaries and perhaps people's bad experiences. But yeah, I agree. Is it uh, antidepressants have an effective rate of about thirty to forty percent on average, from my understanding, and but ECT has a response rate of eighty. You know, talking about eighty percent from people who have you know significantly long periods of depression that are quite well, significant. 
And I think I think what we wouldn't want to minimise though is that there's probably people listening to the, the webinar today who maybe have had difficult experiences, who have, uh, there's issues that we need better research to understand the impact that it has on people's memories. It certainly can impact memory in the short term, and there's issues about whether it does in the long term. So again, yeah, it, it, it's one of those th therapeutic options that I think should be available, but we need better treatments with less side effects. And you know, I keep coming back to that. Is yeah. Although medication can be really helpful, you know, what we need is better, more research to, 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 to come up with treatments that we can predict better who's going to respond to what, can treat these illness, this illness without some of the side effects that the current medications have. What do you think is around the corner in, um, or in the future, treatment-wise? Who knows? I think it's, you know, it's sadly an under-researched area still, and I think we need to campaign, I think, by Poly UK and other organizations need to to, to uh, are great at emphasizing the importance of this condition um you know I, i'm just hopeful that that you know as we understand more about what causes this illness that we'll be able to to develop you know better treatments than the ones we have at the moment difficult to predict though john i think it is isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. Sorry. i think that's um that's it for us Ian, isn't it was there anything else you wanted to talk about, Medicaid? No, I think that's good. Who's next, John? Who we have uh, next? Holly is going to do next, so I'll stop sharing my screen. There you go. <laughs> and over to Holly. Great. Thanks, John and Ian. Um, so my next section now is going to talk about the psychological therapies um, that can be used in the treatment of bipolar disorder. So I'm just going to share the presentation now with you all. Okay, so fingers crossed, this shares okay with everybody. Brilliant. Um, so just to start the session off, um, so access to psychological therapies differs significantly across the UK. And we just click on this next screen. So the next slide um, is just saying that there's a number of different psychological approaches which can be used to help people with psychiatric illness or psychological problems. So although there are many therapies available, it's important to note that the relationship between the therapist and the patient may be a more important factor than the specific intervention that's used. So it's important to put the benefit of psychological therapies for bipolar disorder into context. So although the therapies can be beneficial, um, formal structured therapy may not be suitable for everybody with the condition. So it's important to remember that it's not, not a substitute or an alternative to medication, but that neither will cure bipolar disorder. So the next slide just shows you matrix Cymru evidence tables. Um, so the tables are written by the National Psychological Therapies Management Committee, which is supported by Public Health Wales. So the evidence tables document interventions that have been shown to be useful in managing bipolar disorder based on levels of severity, service and the intensity of the intervention. So as you can see, the BEPC programme is regarded as a useful intervention for those experiencing bipolar disorder. Um, it's important to remember that it can be a long time before you are able to receive psychological therapies. So programmes such as BEPC have been shown to help in aiding recovery. So the next slide show some examples of different psychological therapies that may be offered to you. Firstly, cognitive behavioural therapy, interpersonal and social rhythms therapy, mindfulness based approaches, person-centered therapy, family therapy, sorry, and psychoeducation approaches. So starting off with cognitive behavioral therapy, otherwise known as CBT, this talking therapy can help you manage depressive episodes by changing the way you think and behave. CBT identifies the interactions between a person's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors to establish problematic or unhelpful patterns and it works towards changing these processes. 
CBT was developed as a therapy for the treatment of depression, but it has been shown to be effective in the treatment of bipolar disorder. There are many self-help books out there which detailed CBT approaches to treating depression, and it might be a suitable option for individuals with the condition. So the next approach is the interpersonal and social rhythms therapy. This looks at the roles within our social and interpersonal situations and how these may be adjusted to improve mental well-being. The model focuses on the bi-directional relationship between mood and life events and it aims to assist with improving medication adherence, how to manage stressful life events and reducing disruptions in social rhythms. The therapist aims to identify difficulties in relationship skills and how to improve them. This approach may be particularly suitable for adolescents who might find the homework element of CBT approaches too much like being in school. So this therapy will be discussed later on by my colleague Kate. The next approach that we'll look at is mindfulness. Um, so it's an ancient based practice that encourages an individual to focus on the present moment. This approach incorporates yoga, meditation and breathing techniques. Training ourselves to be more aware of our thoughts, emotions and behaviours will allow us greater control over them. So mindfulness is thought to improve attention, concentration and relationships and has been recognised by NICE as a treatment for recurrent depression. Mindfulness also has a role in the treatment of anxiety which is closely linked with bipolar disorder and in the treatment of depressive episodes in the condition. This next slide describes person-centred therapy. So this is a non-directive approach where the individual is the focus rather than the problem. The therapy is based on three conditions, which are congruence, unconditional positive regard, and empathic understanding. This is a person-to-person -person therapeutic relationship rather than a person-to-therapist, utilising open questions where the therapist will help the individual to recognise that they're fully able to resolve their own issues. Moving on to family therapy, this focuses on improving communication techniques within the family and close relationships through expressing and exploring emotions and working towards appreciating and understanding each other's views and emotions. This therapy aims to achieve reduced negative criticism, promoting positive interaction, reducing emotional over-involvement and practicing resolving conflict. Perhaps the psychological approach that's most promising in bipolar disorder is the basis for this course, which is psychoeducation. So programmes such as BETC enables individuals to better manage their condition by understanding the symptoms of bipolar disorder, identifying their triggers and monitoring their mood to help them stay as well as possible. And lastly, self-help is another approach which individuals may find useful when awaiting to receive other psychological therapies. So many patients will look to self-help strategies in managing their illness and self-help books and websites are useful resources. So for example, organisations such as Bipolar UK can provide further information on the condition and recommendations on where to access help. So as discussed at the beginning of this session, the relationship between the therapist and the patient plays a vital role in the success of the treatment and road to recovery. Research has repeatedly shown that the therapeutic relationship can contribute to better well-being just as much as the type of therapy. Trust is an essential component for a good and productive therapeutic relationship, as well as other helpful attributes such as wanting to provide help, unconditional positive regard, somebody who is non-judgmental, is skilled and qualified, and is culturally, ethnically and gender appropriate. So just here on our last slide, there are three key messages to take away with you today. So firstly, educating people with bipolar disorder about their condition, such as psychoeducation, has been shown to be one of the most helpful psychological approaches. Secondly, many psychological approaches may be helpful, but developing a trusting relationship with the therapist is essential for it to work. And lastly, psychological approaches work best when used alongside other treatments, such as medication and lifestyle changes. So I'll just pause my share now.
and I'll pass you on to Kate um, Fallon, who's going to talk to you a bit more about cognitive behavioural therapy and the interpersonal and social rhythms therapy. But thank you for listening today. Thank you, Holly. Um, okay, I'll just start my screen sharing now and we can back on. Hi, I'm Kate Fallon and I work for the National Centre for Mental Health and have been helping facilitate the BEPSI programme. Today's webinar will be discussing the psychological approaches in bipolar disorder. The two I'm going to be focusing on are CBT and interpersonal social rhythm therapy. So what is CBT? Cognitive behavioural therapy is a type of talking therapy that is commonly used as a treatment for a range of mental health conditions, including bipolar disorder. CBT is a combination of cognitive therapy, examining the things you think, and behavioural therapy, examining the things you do. Research has found that using CBT for bipolar is highly effective in decreasing relapse rates and is thought to be more effective in improving the symptoms of depression than mania. CBT can help you recognise the early warning signs and triggers of a mood change and help you alter the detrimental patterns of behaviour. The theory behind CBT. CBT is based on a model that proposes it is not the event or the situation that destabilises our mood, but in fact the meanings we give to them, i.e. the way we think directly affects the way we behave and feel. For example, if you experience a situation negatively, you might start to feel negative emotions and as a result begin to behave in a certain way. This can then perpetuate into a negative thinking pattern. Negative thinking patterns can start from childhood onwards and if unchallenged can last a lifetime. Let's take a look at Ellen's story to better understand how her negative thinking patterns are affecting her daily life. Over the last few years, I've noticed that when I'm becoming distressed, I don't feel like doing the things I normally like doing. I normally love to go to my allotments at the weekend, but when I'm feeling low in energy, I just can't do it. The longer I leave it, the worse it gets, because obviously it's becoming overgrown. I notice then that I worry about it and I get very guilty about leaving it unattended, and this starts a vicious cycle of me thinking I'm lazy and useless. Maybe some of us can recognise these feelings and behaviours. So here is Ellen's initial CBT model. You can see that her behaviour of staying at home causes her to feel guilty and overwhelmed, which in turn leads her to negative thinking and finally leaves her with the physical sensations of low energy. So let's take a minute and discuss what CBT does and how it might help Ellen's situation. So what does CBT do? In CBT, the role of a therapist is to help you directly challenge these negative thinking patterns and help you break the continuous vicious cycle. Strategies that can be used in CBT include role play, cognitive restructuring, and learning relaxation and stress reduction techniques. Together with your therapist, you will identify and challenge these negative thinking and behavioral patterns that might be causing your mood to destabilize. Over time, this will help you change how you view, feel, and respond to triggering situations. The main goal of CBT and bipolar is to help stabilise your moods and equip you with the cognitive and behavioural skills needed to effectively manage triggers and warning signs. So now let's see how Ellen applied CBT to her experience and how it changed her thoughts, feelings and behaviours. The last couple of times this has started to happen, I forced myself to get up early on a Sunday morning to go to the allotment. This has not been easy and has taken a massive amount of effort. However, I've noticed that by Sunday afternoon, I'm feeling really quite pleased with myself. I think that the big thing has been, instead of spending the morning in bed, winding myself up about it, thinking what a useless person I am, I've actually been out, got some exercise in the fresh air, and even had a nice few chats with people on the allotment. I don't want you to think that this is easy for me. It takes a massive amount of effort and willpower for me to do this when I'm feeling low, but it's definitely worthwhile exercise. It's also really nice to think that actually you can take control of depression in this way. So by changing Ellen's behaviour, she has in turn altered her thoughts, feelings and physical sensations. This is Ellen's new CBT model. 
So Ellen forced herself to get up early to go to the allotment, which means she feels quite pleased with herself and in control. As a result, her thoughts are more positive about herself. And as a bonus, she managed to get exercise in the fresh air and socialised. So to summarise CBT, CBT is an incredibly effective therapy in the treatment of bipolar, in particular the depressive episodes. It uses a combination of cognitive therapy and behavioural therapy to identify negative thinking patterns. Using various techniques, you and your therapist will work towards breaking these negative cycles. We'll now go on to discuss the interpersonal social rhythm therapy. Interpersonal social rhythm therapy is an effective therapy for people with bipolar and mood disorders. It's a combination of interpersonal therapy, examining the links between mood and life events, and social rhythm therapy, examining and emphasising the link between daily routines and mood. Its primary focus is stabilising the circadian rhythm disruptions, which have been observed to cause mood disturbances in certain people. Circadian rhythms are biological processes that include sleep-wake activity, body temperature regulation and neurotransmitter and hormone secretion that repeat cyclically. It is recognised that circadian rhythms are synchronised by light and dark. However, social factors such as stress, mealtimes and exercise can also have a negative impact. People who are more susceptible to mood disorders, whether that be through a genetic predisposition or psychological deficit, find themselves getting stuck when their biological rhythms aren't quite right. So taking a look at the following flowchart, these are all social factors that when disrupted have been said to disrupt your biological rhythm and consequently your mood. So changes in social prompts. This could be loss of a loved one or a change in job. Changes in instability of social rhythms. This might be losing a spouse or loss of a pet. And as a result, this might start to change your daily routines. Change in instability of biological rhythms. Changes in the way you wake, eat, sleep will change the internal biological rhythms, including sleep, appetite and hormone production. All of these changes can lead to an unstable biological rhythm and as a result can lead to somatic symptoms in some people. When we find ourselves in an unstable environment, we are more susceptible to mood disruptions and episodes of mania and depression. So what to expect from interpersonal social rhythm therapy? The main outcome of interpersonal social rhythm therapy is to stabilise social rhythms whilst also maintaining and improving your interpersonal relationships. By stabilising these social rhythms, we are actively protecting disruptions to the circadian rhythm. Typically, the therapy is usually divided up into four phases of treatment. The first initial phase. This stage involves reviewing your mental health history in order to establish triggers and patterns that are linked to associations between social routine disruptions and interpersonal problems. The therapist will provide a detailed psychoeducation about bipolar and establish interpersonal problem areas. There are four problem areas which a therapy might focus on. These are grief, e.g. a loss of a loved one, role transitions, for example, life cycle transitions like adolescence to adulthood, or social transitions like married to divorced. Role disputes, for example, conflicts with parents or spouses. And finally, interpersonal deficits, for example, self-isolating behaviour or avoidance. Throughout this initial stage, you and your therapist will also begin to use the social rhythm metric, SRM, to assess your social routines. This is a simple journal worksheet where you record target time, actual time, a number of people involved in five core daily activities. 
you will also be asked to rate your mood for that day. The second phase or intermediate phase, this phase focuses on stabilizing the social rhythms and intervening in interpersonal problem areas. Using the SRM, you'll begin to identify the most unstable rhythms and work on some achievable goals for change. Additionally, you and your therapist will identify interpersonal triggers, individuals in your life that have a destabilizing effect on your routines, and also those who are supportive. So the third phase, maintenance phase. This aims to reinforce the techniques learned throughout the previous sessions to help maintain social rhythms and interpersonal relationships. The last phase is termination phase. Sessions are gradually reduced until you no longer need therapy and you feel comfortable using the new techniques. So to summarize interpersonal social rhythm therapy. Interpersonal and social rhythm therapy is an evidence-based treatment designed to help people with bipolar improve their mood by understanding and stabilizing biological and social rhythms. The treatments usually are broken into four stages where you will monitor your routines and mood using a social rhythm metric. Overall, research has suggested that interpersonal social rhythm therapy can work well to help you manage both depressive and manic episodes in bipolar. And I'll pass you on, I'll pass you on to Alice who will talk about uh, lifestyle approaches. Yeah, thanks, Kay, and hi, everyone. Um, just to introduce myself briefly, if you weren't here last week, um, so my name's Alice, and I'm a psychology research assistant with the National Centre for Mental Health. Um, and today I'll be talking about the importance of lifestyle approaches um, in the self-management of bipolar disorder. Fingers crossed that's working for you all. Um, so lifestyle then, as I said, has been known to be really important in the self-management of bipolar disorder. And research suggests that even very simple changes to lifestyle can help um, people gain some control over their symptoms um, and to manage their illness more successfully in the long term. So the main areas that I'm going to focus on are sleep, exercise, food, recreational drugs and regular routines. So sleep disturbances then are um, both a core symptom of bipolar as well as a risk factor for triggering mood episodes. And in low moods, some people sleep less and others a lot more than usual. Whereas in high mood, people typically sleep less and can sometimes go for days without any sleep at all. The parts of the brain which are responsible for sleep and mood are closely linked. Um, and it's thought that this may help explain why getting an appropriate amount of sleep is essential to helping to improve mood stability. Sleep disturbance can also easily get out of control. So for example, stress can interfere with sleep, leading you to lie awake at night. And a few nights of poor sleep, perhaps combined with an increase in alcohol use, might trigger a mood episode. Uh, so next of all, diet then. So changes in appetite are also a core feature of bipolar and mood episodes may be associated again with either a significant increase or decrease in appetite. Food's obviously essential to our, our survival and eating a balanced diet can play a huge role in our overall well-being. We need a combination of nutrients in order for our brains and bodies to function optimally and this is best achieved through eating regular balanced meals consisting of a range of sources of fat, protein and carbohydrates. But as I'm sure you all know, diet is a bit of a minefield and um, there's lots of conflicting messages out there. However, the NHS Eat Well Guide can be really useful for giving you an idea of what a balanced diet looks like. The key to maintaining a balanced diet, however, is perhaps not forgetting to include your favourite foods. So for me, that definitely um, means finding room for cake and chocolate within a balanced diet. Um, it's also important to drink plenty of water and to be mindful of how much caffeine you're consuming. And although there's no evidence that any foods can cure depression or mania, um, a balanced diet is vital to our overall health. So exercise then can also be hugely beneficial for both physical and mental well-being. And studies have shown that it can have anti antidepressant effects associated with the release of endorphins. Um, so many people therefore find that it's a useful way of helping them to take control of their mood. 
And even moderate amounts of exercise, such as a 20 minute walk, say two to three times a week, are likely to be beneficial. Um, regular exercise can also have other benefits, such as helping to meet new people, increasing time outside and contributing towards general health. However, during high mood, an increase in energy can make it tempting to exercise excessively. Even if you feel like doing so, it's advisable not to overdo it. Next of all then, um, alcohol and recreational drugs. So problems with alcohol and drugs are common amongst those living with bipolar disorder, as well as a range of other um, mental health disorders. Some people may use these in an attempt to relieve anxiety and depression, or during mania, an increase in use may be related to generally being more sociable or a desire to maximize euphoria and elation. Both drugs and alcohol can, however, interfere with sleep and cause mood symptoms that mimic bipolar. They can also make an underlying mood disorder worse and less responsive to treatment. So, for example, alcohol has a depressant effect and therefore can contribute to more severe episodes of low mood. It can also stop some medications from working effectively. Cannabis has been linked to an increase in anxiety and paranoia. And cocaine and amphetamines may trigger mood episodes and, in, and can increase the risk of rapid cycling. Um, hallucinogens such as ecstasy may also increase the risk of experiencing psychotic symptoms and flashbacks. So the messages are really to moderate your alcohol consumption, avoid excessive amounts and to avoid using recreational drugs together. So along with that, then research has shown that alongside medication, um, keeping a regular routine, including sleeping, eating, exercising and socialising is a really effective way of stabilising mood and to help prevent episodes of depression and mania or hypermania. It may seem really boring, um, but it can actually give you a really satisfying sense of control of your mood. But to save me harping on about it and to give you a personal perspective on this, um, I'm going to hand you over to Kat, who's going to play a video um, of a discussion between Hannah and myself, who you've met already, um, about how she's adapted her lifestyle to help manage her symptoms of bipolar. All right, well, thank you, Hannah, for, for meeting with me virtually, of course, today um, to talk about your personal experience then of using lifestyle approaches as somebody living with bipolar disorder. Um, so first of all, then, Hannah, do you mind me asking how long it is that you've been living with symptoms of bipolar for? Um, hi, thanks for having me. And yes, probably around 12 years now. Okay. In total. So quite a while. All right then, and, and what then is it about your lifestyle then that you found personally most helpful then for managing symptoms of bipolar? Um, well, I think I found in the beginning when I used to get sick, I would let everything slip and I'd spend a lot of time in bed, you know, during depression and stuff like that. And um, I'd be very unmotivated to do anything. So by the time I found the benefit of having a good routine that was gold really you know going to bed early getting up early taking care of personal hygiene just simple things like brush your teeth have a shower and you know do your housework do your dishes do your hoovering and taking care of any correspondences because the more you leave all the very simple basic things the more they're going to mount up and cause you a lot of stress in the long run and make you feel worse. Okay. Okay. So routine then has really been something that's been really valuable for you then personally. Yeah, definitely. I, I find that if I let it slip too much, it's harder to get back into it then as well, but it's, mm -hmm. it's, you can do it. So. Absolutely. Okay, then and have you found then that the COVID-19 crisis has made it more challenging to maintain a lifestyle that helps you to manage your symptoms then? Um, yes, definitely. Um, I rely a lot on friends and family for support. Um, and obviously during the pandemic, we've not been able to see each other. So I've been using things like FaceTime and phoning my friends and family every day sometimes multiple times a day um but they're you know they're still here for me they're very supportive and 
people. So just taking care of myself, making sure that I take responsibility for that too. So I write to-do lists and just make sure that I do, you know, at least something every day, maybe go outside for a walk so that I'm not just stuck in by myself, making myself feel bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it sounds like you've, you've found certain ways then to adapt to the challenges of COVID. Um, managing. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's hard. It's definitely a challenge. Everybody's feeling it, not just mm -hmm. people with mental health conditions, but especially for people that do struggle with their mental health. It, it is hard. Um, but just getting through it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, a lot of us have found ourselves with a lot more time on our hands as well. And I think sometimes it almost creates a bit of pressure to feel like you should be doing more with your time. Whereas actually, I think, you know, it's just a case of trying to adapt to these exceptional circumstances. Um, yeah. And yeah, it certainly sounds like you're doing lots of really, really good things. And I think you mentioned there about kind of keeping in contact with people virtually. And it's a bit strange, I, I found personally, having to adapt to have a lot of kind of communication virtually. But it's amazing that that we do have it and it certainly has been really beneficial for this time I think. Yeah definitely um, and there's lots of mental health services as well that are offering services to virtually too so you know they're really beneficial for people with mental health problems as well. Yeah absolutely and I think that's the thing as well I think you know obviously services are still there even if they are functioning in, in quite different ways at the moment as well. Yeah. Okay so yeah, you've mentioned lots of things then about your lifestyle that you found personally really kind of beneficial for, for managing symptoms of bipolar. So would you have a specific kind of take home message then for other people um, about the best way perhaps to manage um, bipolar using lifestyle approaches? Um, oh, I guess. <laughs> so a lot of people, when you have struggles with your mental health, I say a lot of people because I now know a lot of people that have bipolar disorder um, and we talk and we discuss things and a lot of people will say that they thought medication was going to fix it all and and even I thought it myself I thought I was just gonna go through different medications and find the right one find the you know the perfect combination the one that was going to fix everything for me and it doesn't exist it'll it will help, it definitely will help, but without the right lifestyle changes put into place, things aren't going to change too drastically. I mean, you have to take care of yourself mm -hmm. and you have to do things to stay focused on managing your mental health the best that you can and also to not beating yourself up about it when it slips there are going to be times where you don't stick to your routine and you don't want to get out of bed and that's okay because you have mental health problems and you know you can't let that get to you you just get back on the horse when you're ready brilliant yeah I think you've given two really really important messages there so first you said about you know, medication for you, it's been really helpful, but that, you know, lifestyle in combination with medication is the most beneficial thing for you then. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it is very easy for a long time to just expect medication to fix everything. Mm -hmm. And it, it was never going to happen for me. Everybody's different. So everybody has to approach things in a way that works for them. But for me, it, took being very proactive about things like monitoring my moods and um, sort of making sure that I, I do things every day. So making sure that I do exercise, making sure that I do eat healthy food and keep on top of those things because those are the kind of things that boost your confidence. And, you know, it doesn't take somebody telling you oh you have to do this and you have to do that 
eventually at some point you have to tell yourself that this is what I want to do. I want to manage my mental health and there are steps you can take to do that. Okay. Yeah, I think that's such a such a brilliant message. And I guess it's also perhaps I don't know from your perspective if you'd agree, but a bit of a learning process as well of, of what kind of discovering what is most important to be particularly kind of conscious of in terms of your lifestyle perhaps. Yeah, yeah, making lifestyle choices. I think for me means adapting your life as well in a way that is going to serve your mental health better. You know, there came a time for me where I thought I'm never going to work again. And then I did, I did work again. And I wasn't working full time hours that a lot of, you know, women my age are working. They're working five, six days a week, you know all day and I just had to kind of tell myself that that's not something that works for me Mm -hmm. you know that that is too much stress and as we know stress can trigger episodes for people with bipolar disorder so you have to adapt in a way that works for you yeah and I mean what's more important really than you know adapting your life around ensuring that you know you're in the best mental health that you can be really yeah and just picking up on the second message then um, from your kind of take home message for other people, I guess it sounds as though you're talking a bit about having kind of self-compassion for yourself then and, and kind of understanding that, you know, there will be times which are harder than others and try not to be too hard on yourself about that. Yeah, definitely. You, you know, my mum says to me all the time because I'll phone my mum up and I'll say, mum, I'm not feeling well. I don't want to get out of bed. Uh, why, why is this happening again? And she'll just say, don't beat yourself up. You know, you'll, you'll be well again soon. Don't beat yourself up. So. And I think it's brilliant as well that, you know, you've got your mum to be able to remind you of that as well, I guess, when you're in those, in that position, because I think objectively, when you're not in that position, you can kind of think, you know, that's, that's how it should be. But, you know, when you're actually in that place, it's quite hard to see objectively that, you know, it's it's a, a process really and, and just trying to be compassionate with yourself about it yeah definitely and it's you know it's even hard to see with somebody else telling you so the more you tell yourself the more you'll start to believe yourself too <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely okay brilliant well lots of um, really helpful things um discussed there hannah and it's really really helpful to have it from a personal perspective as well so thank you ever so much for meeting with me today to, today to discuss that thanks for having me i yeah. hope it was helpful to someone oh, absolutely <laughs> hello wow so hopefully you're still with us um apologies for, for running over you managed to get yourself. Those of you who have logged in for your free tickets, you've got extra value for money. It looks like we're going to be um, running an extra 20% of quality uh, <laughs> self-management advice here tonight. So um, there's some, been some excellent questions in the, in the comment section. Um, and if you have any more questions that haven't been answered at all, as we go through them, do, do add them in. We're going to run for another 15 minutes. If we can't answer them uh, on this section now, um, just write them in there and we'll be able to, to write some responses, get them up on either to probably both on the Bipolar UK website and also on, on Cardiff Universities as well. Um, Scott raised a really good point there. There's a, there's a bit of a, there was a blizzard there of really excellent approaches to self-management and you probably wouldn't be able to do all of them. It's like a combination and they're going to work for each person individually. And, Ian said at the start, there's a lot of, lot of trial and error about the best approaches. But I think Scott, who's one of it, made a really excellent comment, which is you could do all of these things and it might not stop you from having a manic or depressive episode. But the key thing is to have ownership of it and to try to be positive about your ability to be able to self-manage. And I think that's a really key thing to take away from today. You might not be self-managing well at the moment, but there's always hope. It is possible to live well with bipolar. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people with bipolar in the UK do it every year. So um, please take hope away as being one of the key messages from today. Um, a lot of the questions are about medication. So some of them might get, get thrown at Ian, but I really do um, want other people on the call as well who have 
made some excellent contributions to, to chip in as well. So um, the first one is there's a key time when people end up often getting diagnosed with bipolar for the first time is that they've, they've ended up um, perhaps being misdiagnosed with depression. They take an antidepressant, they end up going into a manic episode and then they end up being sectioned in hospital. And then that's when they start getting put onto to heavy duty medication. Now, um, I think one of the things that Scott said here is that um, when you come out of hospital, it's really difficult. Apologies, my, uh, my badge is running down there. I uh, should be able to survive. Um, it's really difficult to then come off that medication because the psychiatrists are really reluctant to be able to make those changes. So Ian, do you want to comment on the, um, on the medication side and perhaps some of the other presenters um, we might be able to comment on some of the other approaches that you could use to talk to professionals to be able to kind of change your medication after coming out of hospital? Just one, one point on that time that I think it's really important to make, it, and, and it's an, a point we emphasised at the beginning, is, is that medication and bipolar disorder can be helpful not just in treating individual episodes of illness and getting people well from episodes of depression or, or episodes of mania, but can be helpful in keeping people well, well as, uh, as, as well. What we know, actually, is... is What's very common is that when people feel back to something like normal, they, they can say to themselves, and it's a natural response that we'd all have, maybe I don't need this medication anymore and think, to, I, I, I think that they should stop. There's a real risk, though, of a recurrence of illness if people do that. And so for what, 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 what psychiatrists would, would tend to recommend is for for somebody to be well for a long period, maybe even one year or two years before you think about reducing or coming off that medication. I mean, I think coming off medication is, is often a really good aim to have, but we need to do that in a way that, that, that tries to reduce that risk of, of becoming severely ill again. Thanks, Ian. Um, I think one of the challenges that we've come across as well through our work is just the way that the health service is set up it's very difficult to be able to review medication in a consistent way. It can take years to, to come off medication because it, you, especially if you've got locum doctors who don't know your case history. Um, I understand up in Newcastle, they've got essentially a, uh, an inpatient unit, which acts as a hotel. So people kind of go in and they're able to review their medication under supervision voluntarily over a couple of weeks. Do you think those pro approaches could be effective? I, th I think we need to do it better. You know, I think people with bipolar disorder in the UK have a raw deal, actually. I think it's an illness that's underinvested in. It's not taken as seriously as it should be. Um, and I think what we've seen over the last couple of decades is an increasing tendency for psychiatric services, for mental health services, to, re to, to discharge people very quickly. And I think that's probably the experience that many people will tell you in bipolar UK, Simon. Well, you know, I think that managing bipolar disorder is a really difficult, complex uh, 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 task that, that needs the, you know, the, the expertise of psychiatric teams. And my feeling is, is that we, you know, is that people need that both the expertise of a mental health team and even you know, further specialist expertise for people that specialise in bipolar disorder to, to give advice. I know it's something that you know, Bipolar UK is planning to address with the uh, 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 um, plans it has for, ne for, for next year. And I think, you know, what we need is, is people with bipolar disorder, organisations like Bipolar UK really advocating more for better services for, for people. I mean, one of the things that struck me as we were listening to the presentations uh, today as well is that there's some fantastic psychological therapies that can be beneficial for bipolar but for most people with bipolar across the UK they find it really difficult to access those so I think there's some real you know political progress we need to make in getting mm. the right help for people when they need it. Thanks Ian that's great and Holly and, and Kay it kind of comes on to that are there kind of key things that people can say with bipolar living with bipolar or friends and family when they're talking to their doctors that would help them be able to access some of those really good um, psychological therapies that you were talking about? Sorry, did you want to go first, Kate? No, you go, you go. <laughs> Sorry, you said, is there anything people can specifically say to their GP? 
Yeah, I mean, some people on this call now, probably it's the first time they've ever heard of those different approaches and they sound awesome. So like, if they want to access them, how would they be able to go about doing it in their local area? Yeah, so I think GP is definitely the, the, your first port of call um, to go to. I mean, like I said in the presentation, it shouldn't be treated as a substitute or an alternative to medication, but you could use this sort of multifactorial approach where you could be taking medication and asking for access to certain therapies. Cognitive behavioural therapy is a, a really common therapy that's offered, I think, through the NHS. Ian, if I'm right in saying that, and John? It can be. <laughs> I think it's also useful um, to, um, it's useful getting in touch with a third sector organisation such as MIND or Bipolar UK or Haval because they'll, they'll have good resources about what's going on locally. Um, it, it can be very difficult. I mean, yeah, you can go to the GP and ask for things, but often the GP might have counsellors there, they might not, um, and the counsellors within a GP might, only be, might be time limited for a certain number of sessions, and they might not practice those therapies that have been useful for bipolar disorder. It's, uh, it can be a very challenging situation, Simon. Well, Kate, I think you... it's, it's something that we've struggled with in, 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 in BEPSI, isn't it, is, is, is how much we should raise expectation for people that these therapies are out there, because the reality is, unfortunately, and it's why organisations like Bipolar UK are so needed and campaigning for, for better services. The reality is, is that for many people, they find real difficulties accessing, you know, you know the, 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 these kind of help. So, so I think we, it, it's great that we've covered those, you know, let people know about them. But we really do recognise that, you know, and I'm sure it's the experience of many people on the webinar that actually it's difficult locally to, to access the, the help they need. I don't know if, if, if Sarah and Hannah have had issues themselves kind of accessing help, you know, and, and navigating their way through the, you know, the, the complexities of the health service. It's, it, it seems to me to be really tough, actually. It is. It is. It, there can be times where you're really desperate and you're phoning up saying, you know, I need to see somebody. And then you get an appointment maybe three, four weeks down the line to have an assessment and then that's going to take you another few weeks to get reevaluated. But services that I found really useful have been mined. They generally can get back to you a lot quicker. Um, and also my GP, I discovered recently actually within the last year that they actually have a mental health liaison. So you can get an appointment with them relatively quickly as well. And they know a lot of services in the local area that you can get in touch with via their recommendation as well. Thanks, Hannah. That's great. And obviously at Bipolar UK, we've got our e-community, which is out. People can log on at any time. It's moderated during the day. And also peer support is really, really vital in terms of helping people kind of talk things through with someone else who's had had the same lived experience I mean that can be really powerful as well uh, we've got zoom we've got national zoom group so anytime someone wants to log on in uh, any any week then we can we can accommodate that and we'd love to hear from you anyone on this call right now who's wanting to be able to talk to someone else with bipolar um with bipolar then um just go onto our website and log on to one of our national calls um, good have asked a really good question, which is, is there any, is, hello, is there any organizations that educate different communities, uh, presumably about bipolar? That's a really good question. Is a charity we're looking to set up specialist support groups. So for different, different communities, um, I think, I think there's, there's a connection between people affected by bipolar that transcends all backgrounds and affects everyone equally regardless of their ethnicity and background but we are looking to set up um, specialist support groups for different communities um, so we've got to um, set them up over the next uh, over the next couple of months we're going to probably start uh, first of all the Afro-Caribbean community because I know that there's um, high levels of um, sectioning which are far too high which we're wanting to do some do some work with so hopefully some of the peer supports could help could help with that um, but it, it'd be really good to get the views of um, some of the other panelists if they come across any really good uh, mental health charities for, for, for different communities or um, any projects that have really been tackling bipolar with, within different communities.
I think I, it's not something I'm aware of, but I can recognize Simon, yeah, as you've said, that there's a real need for, for, for this. Um, I suppose, John, the approach that we've taken in the, uh, in the BEPSI program is to offer the friends and family session, you know, where, mm -hmm. you, but that's been kind of bringing people from all different communities all together. And there's nothing that we've done specifically targeted any particular community group, but yeah. yeah. When we go, when we go around and um, when when we're about to have a course, and we go to the area where it's going to be, we obviously talk to the local clinical services, but we also talk to the third sector services as well. Um, but I can't think of anything, Simon, that's uh, anything different than that. Um, good. If you're if you're struggling to have a conversation um, within your community, I think the the mood scale is a really good place to start because it really sets out. You can get it from the Bipolar UK website, but it can really set out how um, how bipolar affects people in different ways in a really relatable way. It makes it really clear, and that could be a really good good place to start with that. So, uh, best of luck, and please do get in touch with us uh, at Bipolar UK as well, because if you if you like to set up a group, we'd really want to help you to do that. So, right, other questions. Also, questions about medication. Um, so, Bell's asked, um, how do you convince? Uh, how did you convince a psychiatrist to say on surgery and Volpera? It's a really tough one. Now, things you were saying earlier about um, pregnancy risks and so forth. Ian, do you want to say a few words on that? Yeah, I think the, the I think the really important thing is to recognise the this, the this, the the potential seriousness of 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 taking Valparate when pregnant. So so, and I think there are other options that it's important to explore. But for some people undoubtedly um, for some women the, that might be there might be really strong evidence for them that, that that medication is particularly effective and other things haven't been in which case I think a really serious uh, uh, con contraception program to make sure that you know that there's no possibility of, of getting pregnant is needed but you know I think you know what we know about the um, uh, the, the the potential problems of taking valproate when you're pregnancy mean that this is a problem that really 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 does need to be taken seriously i think hmm. thanks thanks ian and um, one of the one of the people on the the q a has kind of logged in for the first time they i think they've just received a diagnosis and it seems quite overwhelming and also feels quite grim because there's a lot of there's a lot of negativity there's there's Basically, there's not, not enough research been doing. A lot of the medications don't necessarily work and you can't get access to psychological therapies. I think we need a kind of a word of hope there, Ian, because um, I know I've worked with said, hundreds of thousands of people, I haven't worked personally with hundreds of thousands of people with bipolar. I've worked with loads of people with bipolar who are really self-managing well through different combinations of these things. And also I know that there's hundreds of thousands of people out there with bipolar who are self-managing well, who are having really good, successful careers and uh, it's life's working for them so a message of hope and i think that's really and i think the important point is well we want to be realistic about some of the issues <clears throat> with medications knowing that all medications don't work for all people and there are side effects i think you know what we know is that there's some people who respond fantastically well to to med medications and take them you know with, with problems and using medications in combination with these other approaches that we we've talked about as you've said simon can lead to people really living yeah, a, a, a good life with bipolar. So, I, yeah, so I think, I hope we haven't been too negative. You know, we wanted to be realistic and, 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 and talk about all, you know, all the issues. But yeah, I think that, 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 that hope is a really important message. I wonder if kind of you know, Sarah or Hannah can say anything particularly to speak to, to that. Sarah, have you got any kind of message of hope for, for people out there at my, be um, well, negative things that we've said th there are negativities but yeah life goes on and you can still you can still find a balance and i think hannah has said lots this evening that um the evidence is that you know combining your your um, medication and your lifestyle uh, and and in making positive choices in um in in finding something that works for you um, and in having open conversations and having support from family and friends, all of the things that Hannah's mentioned this evening, you know, are things that have helped me um, lead 
as full as as life as I, I as I think you know we, we want to live. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. There's um, probably just a couple more questions because we're we're reaching that. But I think that's a really important message that we get out there the the one of hope and it is possible to live well um there's a another question on medication but i think it kind of comes in into the sarcadian rhythms which is a lot about sleep but melatonin which i is a is a medication that people can take does it work ian it's difficult it's not something that's licensed in this country um for indication but in many other countries around the world it's a medication that you can buy over the counter to help you know, reset your sleeping patterns. There's not much particular uh, research in it in bipolar drugs. It's probably one of those things that, that we need more data from. But certainly, you know, um, what we know is that paying attention to, to sleep and sleep disruption and sleep patterns can be something that's really important for people with bipolar disorder. So, yeah, unfortunately, we haven't got any great evidence at the moment. And, it, you know, it, it, it's not something that... that is yeah, easily accessible in the UK, but it is in other countries. Some more quick fire questions. Lamotrigine, what are the long term effects? It's a question from, um, from, uh, from Nigel. Hannah raised one of the issues in, in, in her discussion with John previously that, that uh, there can be uh, a very, kind of, quite very rarely, but there can be kind of severe side effects as far as skin rashes are concerned. Um, apart from that, you know. Um, there, you know, whereas some of the other medications like lithium, there are issues with kind of uh, f function of the thyroid and the, and the renal. You know, um, uh, it, it's, it, that's probably the most severe, it's serious potential long term problem. As I say, it's, it, it, it's very rare. Another rapid, another quick response. Um, what's the best way to treat rapid cycling or bipolar with medication? That's from Sophie. Excellent question. Rapid cycling can be a really difficult problem to, to treat. I'd, I'd probably say that there are uh, a number of, of, of things I'd be thinking of. Firstly, um, f maximizing the, all the other approaches that we've talked about, the psychological approaches, the lifestyle approaches, the self-management approaches, really you know, making sure that, that, that somebody's benefiting from those. Thinking about some uh, uh, medical problems like thyroid illness that can cause testing for that to see if that's that's an issue um, there, and then the other big point that came up in the discussion earlier was that we know that sometimes in some people being on antidepressants can make rapid cycling worse so potentially if there's rapid cycling you know, relying on other ways to treat depression rather than antidepressants there aren't any specific medications that are particularly beneficial for uh, rapid cycling often is a matter again of you know of trial and error to see which the best option is and with rapid cycling sometimes it, it can take more than one medication and a combination of medications to 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 help um uh uh, uh, uh control the kind of the, the the mood uh, 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 uh it's best so yeah i'm not sure if that that's quite an extensive list there simon i hope that kind of helps answer that Simon, I think you're on mute. I am, and my phone's literally about to die, so if I disappear, that, that's why. Um, so, question quickly, which I can answer from a facilitator up in Lovian Bipolar. Welcome. Um, has people had any struggle kind of accessing medication? Um, the charity's come across quite a few people because of COVID-19 that they struggle to access medication uh, just because they're not being able to get to their GP. But there has been some really good examples of where pharmacists and GPs and psychiatrists have done kind of virtual consultations, which has worked really well. Uh, but those issues are always, always happening and coming up. So we always try to keep a communication going with pharmaceutical companies because often they tend to be local shortages, which can be fixed quite quickly. So if you do come across a shortage, I'd always report it um, to the manufacturer and they'll, they'll probably be able to get those, get some pallets moved around so they can get access. But it does happen. It is, it is, it is sadly one of the, one of the features. Um, Again, is it a great question on lithium? Is it worth it? I worked with some um, Professor Alan Young at King's, one of our trustees. He's a real evangelist for, for lithium. It's a naturally occurring substance. There's studies in, uh, from Columbia and Texas where people who have had lithium in the water naturally have ended up having much lower rates of suicide in that area. Is it, is it worth it, Ian? 
I, I think we, we, it's something we've covered already, Simon. I think the evidence is probably best, better for lithium being an, a really effective medication for bipolar disorder than, than, than many of the other op options. Again, it's a matter of individual weighing up the, the, the risks and benefit. For some, some people, there's, you know, they seem to be very good responders to lithium. Yeah. And yeah. For other people, there may be other medications that work better. But yeah, I think it's something that we probably need to, to think of uh, uh, using yeah, more, if anything, be, you know, yeah, because of its you know, good, really good efficacy in, in, in many people with this condition. Thanks, Ian. And I think this unfortunately is going to have to be the. Come in there. Sorry, John. You you're on mute. Oh, again, I'm on mute again. I'm a... I think one of the good things about lithium is that it's because it's such an old drug. We got loads of safety data. What the long term effect is, because people have been on it for you know 50, 60 years, so we know what the long term effects are compared to the newer drugs, and we're still in the dark a little bit. So that's what I was going to say. Thank you both, uh, both of you. Um, I think this is probably going to have to be the last question because we've, we've, we've gone over by half an hour. I'm sure people have got their, their dinners uh, to go to now as well. Um, it was a really difficult one, perhaps just one for, for Hannah and Sarah. Going through a manic episode is really traumatic. Um, how can you trust a professional when you're in a manic mood? John, as a professional, maybe you want to answer that one first. I don't know. Um, I, I don't think, <laughs> I'm just scared what no, they're going to say. Sorry, no. I was just going to say that um, I had a bit of advice from my friend who uh, suffers with a lot of manic episodes. And he actually wrote a letter when he was feeling very stable to his psychiatrist so that he could trust it then when he was manic. He could trust what he had written previously. That's all. <laughs> Did that help, Hannah? Was that a useful thing that he played? I don't know, he hasn't had a manic episode yet, so <laughs> we'll see. That's really great, and I think that applies as well for family members, which can be really traumatic for them as well, supporting someone through that process and writing something down together, having like an advanced choice document can be a really powerful tool in terms of people being able to decide what care they want when they're in a stable um, frame of mind and ensuring that they get that when they, when they do get poorly. So, so I think that's, that's most of the questions, just about all the questions answered. We're getting um, 8.30 now. So I'm gonna, gonna wrap this up. I just wanna say a massive thank you for all of you for, for joining us tonight. We're gonna be doing another session next week as well. So I hope, you, hope you be, you'll be able to join us on that. Um, Ian, do you wanna just quickly run through what's gonna be covered next week? Next week we're talking about kind of really kind of the, the, the number of self-management. So I think that's a really key one to, to go through with all the kind of basis that we've done over the last week in this. I think you know that that, that will be an incredible use. I think. I think one thing to say, Simon, is that you know any unanswered questions that people have got, we'll look at those um, and put something up on the MCMH blog and let people know how to be able to access that. And we'll send people again a kind of link to. Uh, to the recording of this, so if they want to come back and look at, it, you know, go through anything that 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 they want to, again, that will be possible as well. Thanks, Ian, and um, no, it's very really much appreciated. And if you do enjoy these, uh, we'll be sending an evaluation uh, survey out over the next couple of weeks. So do respond to it and tell us whether it's been good or bad and so forth, because we we're always learning, always improving. And if you do like it and you want more of these, then we'll, we'll, we'll want to do it. So do let us know. Um, so I think it's time for us all to say goodbye. Um, so bye, Ian. Bye, John. <laughs> bye, Holly. Bye, Kate. Um, bye, Alice. Bye, Sarah. Um, so I haven't, I, bye, Hannah. Hopefully I haven't missed anyone out there. Just want to wave to the camera and um, hopefully we'll all, we'll all join together again next week. So have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. Bye now. Right.